we are going to be looking at uh, Descartes a little bit today, and just I want to remind you of a little scheme that we've talked about on other occasions, bringing it back to you, and this is a good time to do that, in which when we think about the way in which Christians have reflected on their understanding of what's called Christian philosophy, and in more, you know, somewhat more specifically Christian apologetics, um, <clears throat> there have been these a variety of uh, points of view. Let's see, is this, is this my little stack of handouts? I was wondering if we could remove my stack of handouts. There. <coughs> Sneak peeking at Descartes. Mm -hmm. uh, so on one extreme, we have a view that would be called faith without reason. <laughs> that is an approach to Christian conviction which essentially proceeds more or less 100% on the basis of faith. Not looking for, indeed sometimes despising, rational props, viewing them as a sign of weakness. So who would be uh, the classic example of a, well first of all, what would be the term that we've used to describe that particular point of view. That would generally be called, what, Laura, do you know the term we apply here? Faith without reason. Faith really in opposition to reason. Faith opposed to reason would be, you know the term I'm after? No, no, not exactly. Huh? That would be, they call it? Presuppositional? Well, not exactly. The presuppositionalists would be a little bit offended if you uh, accuse them of what I've just described there, but it would be sitting there. Fideism? Okay, fideism. <clears throat> so that's a term you should know by now. So if you don't know it by now, know it now. Okay, get it nailed down. Fideism. Faithism. The simplest expression of it, I believe because I believe. Don't bother me with the details, rational proofs, archaeological evidence. I don't care about that. That is viewed as actually sabotaging your faith. Your faith is better off without it. You're mixing faith with this world's wisdom when you do that. See that? And you've got people that think that way. Who's the most famous? I don't think he belongs here, but he's commonly put here as a kind of symbol of Christian fideism. And the guy's name is, but you know, Avery, you moved. What is it? Uh, I was just thinking Augustine. No, 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 no. Augustine is, uh, he's not that extreme. There is a guy that actually states it more forcefully than Augustine ever thought of. Who am I after? Josiah, any idea? No? We read him earlier in this year. Josiah? Sure, Tertullian. All right, Tertullian. And he gets the reputation for being a Phidias because he says what? What's one of the most famous phrases that comes from Tertullian that has been the, largely the reason he's tagged with being a Phidias? And that phrase is... Oh, come on, man. We've talked about this. You're all supposed to know this. Anybody? Stephen? It is? Avery? Go ahead. I believe because I believe, not because of evidence. No, well, I thought you were going to say it. Not quite. Okay, here it is. Get this, friends. At this late date in your careers, you should have this down in your DNA. He says, I believe because it is absurd. Right? That's Tertullian's phrase. I believe because it is. He's the one that asked the question, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? You know, right? But in the context of that, he says, I believe because it is absurd. In the 20th century, there's a very influential Christian theologian who I think does deserve the term Phidias. And having now had a chance to read some of him and fair, you know, not within the last two or three months, I'm even more persuaded of this than I used to be. And his name is, anybody know, who's the most famous 20th century theologian? And maybe I could ask the question that way and stop right there. 
Who is the most famous theologian of the 20th century? Comma, who also happens to be, uh, you know, a robust, fittiest, and it has been? Is that Francis Schaeffer? No, 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 no. He's certain, Francis Schaeffer is certainly not the most famous theologian of the 20th century, and he's certainly not a fittiest. He's well known in some circles, including ours, but I mean, this guy is internationally famous. But no, all right, Karl Barth. Barth, all right. And Barth believes that when you start constructing rational proofs for your faith, you are building bridges with the devil. He believes that's one step toward liberalism. He was trained as a liberal. He was trained in Germany. Everybody's a liberal in Germany. You know. He was trained as a liberal under Schleiermacher. He learned under the most probably famous liberal in the 19th century. That was his training and that was his belief. Until, as he was rolling into the early 20th century, he began to see where he thought liberalism must inevitably lead. Where? Totalitarianism, Nazism. And that's where he was. And he could connect the dots. He could see how you could start with this sweet, lovely, liberal spirit of the 19th century and wind up with death camps. He saw the connections. And that's why he went from one end to the other. He leaped from being a liberal, that's not my scheme here, my spectrum, but he leaped to being a radical, you know, uh, conservative, you might say. I'm using that term somewhat guardedly. But he leaped to being one who wants to keep faith pure. Not susceptible to being infected with human reason. And to this day, he has a huge, he's had a huge impact. It's kind of an existential, you know, Christian theology. Um, <clears throat> but he was orthodox in many ways. He believed in Christ. He believed in the resurrection. He believed in the atoning sacrifice. He believed the things that probably, I assume all of you in this room believe, but he didn't believe that you should argue for any of it based on some kind of natural human proofs. He is a presuppositionalist on steroids. He is way beyond any presuppositionals that, that you might otherwise study in apologetics here. I don't know if you guys dealt with Bonson or some of those guys in apologetics. Yeah, I'm not okay, well. Um, okay, go ahead, Avery. Um, would people that have studied Bart agree with you in saying that he is a strong idiot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> it's it's a little bit ironic because usually you wouldn't think a Phidias would have so much to say that would sound like so much so rational. I mean, he, he writes, you know, more than most people read in a lifetime. <clears throat> but when you read him on this topic, uh, it, it's not like it's obscure. You know, if we had a little more time, I'd take it to the text that, where he really works this out. He believes faith comes based on the, the immediate and direct encounter you have with the living Christ and that once you've been persuaded of that basis, any additional props are an insult to your faith. That's the way he would put it. <clears throat> and, you know, you, you have to, whether you agree with him or not, you have to allow that he's quite a cogent thinker and that he argues that pretty persuasively. All right, so that's uh, Phineas. And now on the other end of the spectrum, we would have a view that you call reason without faith. This still falls broadly within the great scheme of Christian apologetics, um, but it would be the, uh, exactly the opposite of a fideistic approach where basically I'm only going to believe those things that are demonstrable rationally. And so a person would not be called a fideist if they're over here, they would be called instead a Macon. Rationalism. That's right. It's some kind of rationalism. <clears throat> and the name that we would associate with uh, about as pure a rationalism as we could find in the history of Christian thought or this history of thought generally would be the name of, who do you suppose would be there? This is 
like, something you should be able to say now without any great thought. Jacob, of course, the name I have in mind here has got to be Descartes. Descartes. It's no accident that Karl Barth has nothing good to say about Descartes. And Descartes, had he ever met Karl Barth, would have very little good to say about him. You know, these guys are about as, as uh, opposite as two could be, epistemologically. All right, then the intervening positions, we have two positions, one in which faith leads, faith precedes reason, and one in which reason precedes faith. The guy that would be the champion of faith preceding reason, I believe, in order to understand, that, of course, would be Trevor. For $64,000. I knew I was safe. <laughs> and I'll throw on a free trip to Maui. What's the answer? Oh, all right. Um, we're just going to guess a name here now. Because what do we got to lose, right? Pride, maybe. What? I could lose pride. Pride, um, that's right. Australian Augustine. Oh, man, you got it right. <laughs> So much for the retirement fund, so much the marriage down the tubes. I just sold my life to Trevor. I know you've got some money saved up. All right, that's correct. Augustine stands for the idea that I believe in order to understand. We went through the whole deal of his faith. Remember that? The five kinds of faith, each one sort of leading us more and more to robust, true, heartfelt Christian faith, but starting at a very modest level. Just think with an open mind. You know, that's still a kind of faith. You remember all that, don't you? Because you're going to be tested on it in about a week. So it's all going to be back flooding into brain things of yours. And then, of course, the name that associates with a view that reason precedes faith. You know, in other words, as I exercise my you know, rational faculties or even scientific faculties, it will lead me inevitably to faith. And the guy we would put here, this is the easy question, would be Matthew, of course, this guy. No trip to Maui, no 64,000, nothing except glory. We're getting the right answer here. Aquinas? Yes, thank you, Aquinas. Is that the first time in history that somebody has gotten 64,000? <laughs> you know, I think. Uh, I think I think it's the first time I've ever set it up in a way that I couldn't really escape it very easily. I think, um, let's see, I've got I to think like a lawyer here. How do I get out of this? We didn't shake on it. There was no consideration, no contract, nothing enforceable. Yeah. All right, so anyway, Descartes, all of this is simply to have you thinking about uh, Descartes represents this uh, approach, which wants to be, just as Barth wants to be 100% based on faith, Descartes in some ways wants to be 100% based on reason. He wants everything you believe to follow more or less inevitably and unavoidably from the exercise of good reason. You know, he doesn't want any leaps, any you know, jumping out there. And the reason for that is, of course, because the setting in which he found himself in Western civilization <coughs> was a period of what? What was going on in the world? Trevor, what was happening in the world? We talked about this fairly recently when Descartes comes on the scene. What's the characteristic of European thought at that point? I think it was the Enlightenment. So Enlightenment? It was, it was uh, more skeptical. Okay, really, that's right. The Enlightenment wasn't, uh, it was skeptical in some ways, but, but it was really just the whole sort of tumultuous time in which there was a crisis of confidence. What can I trust? 
The church has lost faith. There's been all kinds of questions raised about the Bible. Can I trust the Bible? That was uh, certainly being questioned in many quarters. Uh, can I trust anything, any religious authority? That had been, you know, for a long time, the, the uh, place where I thought I could find some kind of security. And it seemed that nothing much was left that you could trust. And Descartes wants to say, well, what can you trust? And so he begins by taking the spirit of the 17th century, the 1600s, and putting it on steroids. You know, people were sort of doubting generally. He wants to doubt with an incredible amount of vigor. He wants to doubt everything. He wants to put everything in a state of you know, questioning whether it can be relied upon. And so oddly enough, even though Descartes is trying to give us great certainty, he begins on a premise of radical uncertainty. And that's what's called his first meditation. <clears throat> Some people said Descartes' first meditation may be one of the most powerfully influential little documents uh, ever written in the history of the human race <clears throat> because even though he wants to reassure you of things you can have confidence in he starts by just systematically leveling everything everything is what doubt your sense perceptions doubt your mind doubt mathematics doubt authority doubt this doubt that doubt everything is there anything when all the dust settles that you finally cannot doubt you know and to uh, because the first meditation is fairly short rather than proceeding to a further discussion this is going to be one of those rare occasions in this class because we haven't done a lot of this where I'm going to have you read on Descartes and uh, it's only four pages so I'd like you to read it digest it and virtually memorize it uh, by the end of this period, so that when I give you an excruciatingly, painfully detailed little quiz on it tomorrow, you will, but it's dead week. So my quiz can't count anyway, but I still will do it, just so you'll see whether you uh, got it. So I'd like you to read this. It isn't that long, actually. I think you'll easily finish it by the end of the period.